Good evening and welcome to the Board of Education meeting, regular meeting of Tuesday, August 25th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible justice. liberty, and justice for all. Okay, um, Mrs. Norcell, correspondence. We received 27 emails since the last Board of Ed meeting. Some of them were answered by our chair. Emily Boyle, Shannon Ratsid, Erica Stridmeyer, Jerry Prescadino, Jerry Jennifer Hill-Cullen, Melissa and Martin Usergo, Shella DeVito, Gilda Kumata, Brenda Gilmore, Danielle Dunleavy, Sarah Levine, Christine Wadham, and Sheboyan Lindington, all uh, were requesting uh, maintaining a grade five section and, and adding a grade two and four section at Daniel's Farm and one to retain the grade four at Frenchtown. Um, Sarah White, Emmy T. Wu, Mercedes Mullins, Christine Sabad, Kelly Kenzel, all had issues, questions, and or suggestions for a reopening plan and wanted more communication. They felt communication was lacking. Nicole Helfaffer uh, feels that Trumbull High School social studies is taught through a white perspective and that it needs a comprehensive anti-racist curriculum. Carrie and Tony Gentile I want to see lower class sizes, especially at Hillcrest Middle School, grade seven and eight math classes. And that was our correspondence. Thank you very much. Our public comment, uh, Nick Banks. Our public comment, our first speaker is Mr. Nick Banks. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Nick Banks. I am reading a TEA statement for our BOE rep as she was not available for this meeting. Uh, as the start of a very different school year looms on the horizon, teachers in Trumbull share many of the concerns of their colleagues around the state, the nation, and the world regarding returning to in-person learning this fall. In a recent survey taken by 446 Trumbull teachers, the staff made it crystal clear how they feel about the most important issues regarding safety protocols, instruction, and communication. 97% of teachers polled believe that all staff and students should be required to wear masks, and 89% say that it's not appropriate to reduce social distancing guidelines of six feet between individuals in classrooms. The TEA has asked you to close these loopholes before, yet we're only days away from the opening of schools in Trumbull. When it comes to instruction, 70% of teachers do not feel comfortable live streaming lessons to students at home while teaching students in person in the hybrid model. Most importantly, 94% of teachers stated that the communication for administration and the district during the summer months has not provided a clear understanding of what is expected of teachers during any phases of the reopening plan. In addition, the plan that was worked on by TA officials, along with administrators and parents and committee, did not resemble the one that was revealed to the public. The lack of communication, scheduling, and information remains as one of the mitigating factors in establishing teachers' comfort levels in returning to schools, as 71% of teachers indicated that they did not feel safe returning to in-person learning on September 8th. If teachers were instead informed on a weekly basis with frequent transparent updates, they would have been able to provide to return to school in a curricular and personal fashion. The lack of information and communication in a time of constant change is clearly the chief factor in a loss of faith and patience with the district. We ask that communication be more frequent. We also ask that you include teachers every step of the way in formulating plans and discussing the issues related to the new world that we enter this week. Teachers are by nature problem solvers. Don't squander the valuable resources you have in front of you to make the needed changes regarding safety and instruction for the benefit of all students and staff. We also ask that board consider 
budget appropriations to cut down on cohort sizes in classrooms so that all the safety protocols social distancing. Currently, some cohorts are as large as 15 and up. Those class sizes are unsafe and will offer virtually no social distancing in many of our classrooms. It is unfortunate that the budget surplus in the $2 million range at the end of the fiscal year needed to be utilized to fill budget gaps from the previous year and was not used to fully staff the schools and provide resources for the 2021 school year. The TA was happy to see the district's adherence to the state's indoor meeting protocols regarding restricting meetings to 25 individuals or less by making all professional development sessions and meetings virtual, and we would hope that these re regulations are followed throughout the school year to ensure safety and social distancing. Please see us as partners in this effort to do our best in the most difficult of situations for the upcoming school year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Our next is our superintendent report. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tippinelli. Um, first of all, let me just respond. Uh, we should don't go a point by point from uh, a comment, but uh, um, Nick did a very nice job in outlining uh, certain positions that uh, the TEA has taken. I do want to say a couple of things about that. As far as communication, we have tried to communicate be as transparent as possible through e-blasts, weekly newsletters. Uh, we have a, a subcommittee comprised of 20 uh, uh, some odd people I think it's five or six who are TEA members who all contributed to our plan. They had input to that. I've uh, had several conversations with John Mastriani with regard to uh, communication with him on our plan. So we try to disseminate as much as we can. Uh, it is physically impossible to respond to all of the questions from the public. Okay. Uh, Jonathan has done a yeoman job in trying to do that but it's almost impossible. HR has tried to do it. I uh, tried to do it. And we're still gonna to try to do it, but we can't promise on, on every single question, okay? But uh, we will try our best as we always have. Um, secondly, I want to uh, compliments to Scott uh, Kerr and to David Weitzman, who's a social worker at uh, Frenchtown. Uh, they embarked on a sign, um, Posting at each school. We have signs coming in. The high school and the two middle schools have the same sign. The elementary schools are having a contest for you know civility, love, compassion, etc. Um, and uh, love lives here. Yes, yes. You can you can be in the contest. <laughs> you may have won. That's your slogan. But uh, that we appreciate the, their effort and their input uh, with regard to that. Um, I also want to congratulate uh, our national PTSA for having been selected uh, as a phase two COVID relief funding recipient. Highly regarded uh, honor, uh, competitive grant as only 14% of the applicants receive funding. Um, the PTSA will receive $15,000 to bring our district uh, to be used for mental health, social and emotional support and professional development. We are very proud of their selection and very grateful of their continued support for the Trumbull Public Schools. Uh, I'm most pleased with this next announcement. We just received word that the funding breakdown of the total uh, coronavirus relief funds uh, for the approximately 160 school districts in Connecticut. Um, aside from the large big six districts, those are Bridgeport, Hartford, New Haven, Norwalk, Stanford, and Waterbury, um, and the rests, okay, uh, Trumbull fared quite well in the allocation of money, we received $1.631 million uh, to be used for the corona uh, effort, okay? Um, very proud because only four out of more than 160 districts received more monies, okay? I think it was East Haven, Middletown, and one other, but uh, we received 1.6 million. I will say this also, everybody in the state the original figure that they submitted was reduced. I think I told the board the weekend before, we actually submitted 5.325 million, but we got 1.6. All the other districts were also similarly reduced, okay? Certainly appreciative of the monies um, and uh, we'll put it to good use. Um, the public uh, and the board um, should know that the new superintendent, uh, Dr. Semmel, uh, Marty Semmel, uh, and I have been on several occasions for the new transition a myriad of topics and issues were discussed. 
and um, more are to be reviewed before Marty officially comes on board September 14th. Okay, it's a Monday and he will be here. In fact, he was here today for most of the day uh, to do some interviews that I'll speak to a little bit later. Um, in a related vein, and he's in the middle of your screen here, uh, um, Paul Hendrickson uh, from Plymouth uh, will join us soon after the September 11th date. Uh, and our new agro science director, uh, Dr. Linda Pasloff, is there, and she is in the middle, uh, middle, middle. Uh, Paul spoke last time. Linda, welcome aboard. You have any comments? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, good evening. I'm I'm thrilled to be returning to the Trumbull Public Schools in my new role as Director of AgriScience and Biotechnology Center. Thank you for your confidence in me as I embark on this journey uh, with both former and new colleagues. When I retired from the Trumbull Public Schools five years ago, where I had served as both Bee House Principal and the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessments, I had hoped I might return someday to assume this leadership role at the AgriScience Center. Um, as a matter of fact, I even enlarged to poster size a photo of the llamas I had taken to serve as a faux window in my windowless Trumbull High School office, framed by curtains I had made. And while I've kept busy in the world of higher education since then, working as both a professor and a school of education director with adult learners seeking future careers as teachers or school leaders, I've missed interacting with high school students. After all, I had spent 18 years of my career in high school settings as both a teacher and administrator. What is wonderful and unique about the AgriScience Center is that it brings students from 10 school districts together to learn in a setting that will assist them in making important decisions about their future vocations. This is secondary education at its best. And I'm dedicated to continue the fine tradition of those who served in this position before me as well as assisting my colleagues in meeting the needs of a diverse population of learners who seek a non-traditional high school experience. I hope to meet with you all again in person in the near future. And if you recall me from past years, I will bring the candy to the meetings. Thank you, thank you. That was gonna be my first question. <laughs> Linda is well known for that. Linda, welcome aboard, we're glad to have you. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Thank nice you. working with you again. Yes, Linda. I'm I'm so excited, Jackie. Thanks. Okay, well, I'm sorry, one, one other thing. Um, I apologize. Um, I was notified today when I was in contact with the police department for coordination that uh, a Black Lives Matter protest rally will be held, uh, like they had on Saturday uh, a month or two ago at uh, Town Hall. It will be held on the grounds of Trauma High School on Sunday. August 30th, I think the times are 12 to 1.30. Uh, I am told the focus is on the social studies curriculum and updating of such. Um, as you know, yes, um, department chairman, uh, Kathy Urbano was heading a committee of uh, certain uh, uh, graduate students who will come back and want to really get involved in uh, bettering the curriculum uh, in social studies, given uh, the times, and uh, she's already doing that. There's a process that we follow. They know that, but uh, they already have some courses that they're thinking about putting in. The Kathy will be meeting again with them to funnel it through and direct it through uh, our uh, course selection process. Okay, um, that's it. I promise. Okay, thank you. All right, the next is uh, the board chairman report. First, I would like to introduce and welcome Andrew Palum as the new member of the Board of Education for the remaining term until the special election. Uh, Mr. Palo is an accountant with eight years of experience on the Trumbull Board of Finance, and he has two children in Trumbull Public School. Uh, hi, Andy, I thought we'd say welcome to you. Thank you for coming this evening, glad you're here. In case anyone was wondering, he was sworn in yesterday, so he is a member of the Board of Education. Welcome, Andy. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome, Andy. Thank you. Glad to have you. Look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. We do too. Thank you. Okay, our next is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of 8-11-2020. I'm going to need a motion 
Motion to approve the minutes of the presented, Madam Chairman. I need a I, second. I second that. Second. Gallo seconds. Okay, any comments from anyone? Scott, Jackie? No. Okay, everybody, okay. I'm gonna take the vote so everybody can hear it. Tim Gallo? Um, I'm in favor. In favor. Mike Ward? I'm in favor. Marie Petiti? In favor. Scott Kerr? Yes, in favor. Jackie Norcell? I'm in favor. Lucinda Timpanelli? In favor. And Andy West Bank, if he wasn't here. Is that correct? correct? Okay. Okay, that's approved. Next is personnel, Mr. Isaiah. Thank you. Um, the board is asked uh, to accept the uh, um, resignations of the three individuals listed on the personnel report. We certainly appreciate all the contributions to Trumbo Public Schools and wish them the very best in the new endeavors. Thank you. All right, um, Mr. Gallo, I need you to make the motion, please. So I would make a motion um, for the following resignations. Uh, Marie Cohen, Spanish teacher at Trumbo High School since August 2011, resigning effective August 24, 2020. Erin McGonagall, who is a language arts teacher at Hillcrest Middle School since August 2017, resigning effective September 18, 2020. And Lauren Peterson, who is a special education teacher at Middlebrook Elementary School since August 2013, resigning effective August 18, 2020. These are for the resignations for all three of these employees. I need a I'll second. second that. And Jackie Norcell seconds. Okay. Uh, is does anyone was anyone like to make a comment? I don't know if anyone knows anyone. Well, I will. I know Marie Cohen. Um, she started at Trumbull High School. She was a very good Spanish teacher. She was moving to uh, Hillcrest, and now I guess she's leaving. And I didn't know that, but I wanted her to know she did a good job when she was at Trumbull High School. I'm proud of her had her as a first year teacher and she did well in our department. I wish her all the best. Okay, if there isn't any other comment, I will take the roll. All in favor, uh, Tim, Tim Gallo. I'm in favor. Mike Ward. I'm in favor. Ray Petiti. <clears throat> in favor. Scott Kerr. Yes, in favor. Jackie Marcel. Yes, in favor. Senator Timpanelli in favor. Andy, I think you can vote for this. Yep, in favor. Yes, in favor. Okay, that's unanimous all in favor. Thank you. All right, our next is the approval of the child nutrition program. Mr. Isaiah and Head Start. We also have to leave. Oh, leave of absence. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We have one more that's a leave of absence. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, leave of absence. Oh. Yeah, on the personnel committee, um, we are asking for the board to approve the leave of absence uh, for uh, Ms. Catron. She has followed all stipulations and provisions of the Board of Education policy. Okay, thank you. Okay, I would make the motion um, to approve the request for a leave of absence of Melanie Cutrone, who is a kindergarten teacher at Jane Ryan Elementary School since August 2015. She's requesting a personal leave of absence without pay for the 2020-21 school year. This request complies with the Trumbull Board of Education leave of absence policy 4150. I'll second that. I'll second that. Marcel seconds. Okay, all in favor, Tim Gallo? I'm in favor. Mike Ward? Yes, in favor. Marie Petiti? Yes, in favor. Scott Kerr? Yes, in favor. Jackie Norcell? In favor. Andy Palo? In favor. Thank you, and Senator Timpanelli, in favor. All right, thank can you. I ask, can I ask a question about the, the leaves? Not, not these specifically, but just in regards to any leaves that come up as a result of um, the reopening, will all of those come before us in this fashion going forward? All, all leave of absences do come before the board, yes, Scott. Okay. Except for FMLA. Right, except for FMLA, family medical leave. Um, um, HIPAA has the requirements against that. But all the leaves come before the board per policy. Okay, but if, if someone qualifies for FMLA as a result of 
COVID, then we would we won't we won't see those. Those will be handled through human resources. Right, it, it's handled through human resources in uh, following the provisions of the statute of the law. Okay. Ralph, would we at least have an, uh, be able to know like we have six or we have seven or eight, would the number be something you could report on? Yes, I could. Okay, because I would like to personal at least have the number. Yes, we could. Do we have any of those numbers currently? I think the board approved two prior to this. It's coming up in the uh, enrollment report. We actually have a little commentary about those uh, numbers of teachers. Your, your policy requires you to vote on discretionary leaves of absence like Mr. Trump. Um, the pop, the ones that come in under FMLA are not discretionary for the board, um, so we process them right away based on the legal obligation. We'll have the numbers for you uh, a little later tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks John. so much for that clarification. Okay, next on the agenda is the approval of the child nutrition program. Head start. Right, this is a minor change, just uh, in signature going from Dr. Chaffin to myself. Uh, but the board will have to do that again once uh, Dr. Semmel comes on board, too. It's just the signature change to my name. Okay, and that's already been completed? You, you signed it. Tonight. Yeah, I signed it. But I signed that for Mrs. Norcell. She usually signs that. Yes. Jackie, that was okay. Right? Thank you, Lucinda. Okay. I don't have a fax machine here. Okay, thanks. Okay. Our next is the uh, school reopening update, Mr. Ansel. Okay, thank you. Many already know that Thursday, August 27th, is the first day of school for teachers. We'll begin the day with the mini convocation, uh, which will be live streamed. Our uh, teachers will uh, go to their respective schools and see that, and then they will branch out uh, into uh, professional development. The board has already received this document that shows the professional development that each staff member will get additional information on key topics, particularly as uh, Nick Banks pointed out on the COVID, okay? Uh, but um, that's all set to go. Uh, also during the live streaming, our teacher and paraeducator of the year will speak, as well as uh, Dr. Semmel, Marty, and myself. And, and again, as I mentioned, following the meeting, professional development sessions will be held uh, as planned. Okay, they would go for, I think it's five days um, until the eighth when we begin regular school. Are they on Zoom or? Yes, yes, because we can't have large uh, gatherings in compliance with the, uh, the government. Okay. Um, this is a, <laughs> a revolving ball, it seems, uh, and that's whether we are going to play football or volleyball and volleyball during the fall sports. The CIAC came out and said, yes. The Department of Public Health said, wait a minute, no. They have been meeting for almost a week trying to come up with a compromise plan. Uh, it was supposed to happen um, Friday, didn't. Over the weekend, they met on Sunday night, it didn't. Uh, today, again, we have not received any word. Uh, conditioning programs were given okay. But uh, Mike King, our athletic director, uh, is on top of this and he's done a, a lot of hard work in it. It keeps us informed, but uh, the decision has to come down from the CIAC, but more importantly, from the Department of Public Health uh, because uh, with the COVID, medical issues, et cetera. Um, and I know a lot of people are disappointed in both ways, but particularly they want to have more activities for our youngsters, as we all do. It's good socially, emotionally, et cetera. Um, but uh, we just have to wait and see what's going to happen. But time is running out. Uh, with sc most schools opening within two weeks, um, we'll have to wait and see. As soon as I find out, I will disseminate that uh, to the board. I just want to update uh, the board and the public on our, uh, our key vacancy of the Jane Ryan principalship. Uh, we had uh, about two, 50 candidates apply, applicants. Uh, we each um, paid the screen in. I say we, Jonathan had a look at some, but the, uh, Marty and I really did bulk of the screen with regard to that, and we came away with 12, then we reduced that to, we were either going to do 12 or six. We decided to do six. The determining factor was that they had elementary experience, uh, definitely teaching, and most importantly, if they had uh, assistant principalship or principalship at the elementary level. Uh, we did, uh, and all six did. And uh, that's why we didn't take some people with good, excellent skill sets, 
but couldn't make the jump. We didn't believe Marty and I both. We uh, we did a list. I did a list, and the common people and there was the six were in our list. Okay, so it worked out well. They went through two rounds of interviews with the, um, the school committee um, coordinated by Donna uh, Seidel, uh, acting interim principal there, um, another administrator, Gina from uh, um, Frenchtown, and also two teachers and two parents from the Jane Ryan community. They came up with a strong recommendation for one, but we brought three forward. Um, Marty met with Jonathan and one uh, um, Peg Brandisi, uh, our assistant uh, business manager uh, today, and uh, they have come up with a, a recommendation of one individual. Um, they could have said two, but they decided one would be best. However, I want to emphasize that now the vetting process starts. Okay, the individual doesn't know that he or she is the so called finalist. Okay, because if you go through the vetting process, you find something, then you would have to look elsewhere. And we didn't want the next person who was very qualified, but um, this one person stood out at each level. In fact, the committee wanted to hire that person that day. And I think one of the comments was before he leaves the building, we get him to sign a contract. Actually, we didn't, uh, but so there's a lot of groundwork in that. But um, we will start the vetting process. No one will be contacted until the board is aware of it. And, uh, you know, Marty agrees with it. And if necessary, if the vetting doesn't come in, we'll give you, you know, two people, that person and another person um, to move forward with it. But nothing will be finalized until the Board of Education knows what the status of the person is in the vetting process. Sure. So, you've already heard me say this, Ms. Donna. I, having just been on the rotation for administrators, we are one of the highest paid in Fairfield County, as you can see, we looked at that. Um, I think we're a little bit disappointed that our pool wasn't bigger. Um, uh, again, that we should have at least three or four finalists. And I'm a strong opinion of in-person interviews. We did that with our superintendent. Uh, we have always, except for one, in the five and a half years I've been on the board, there's only been one exception where the board did not at least participate and hear the candidates in person. As I explained to our new superintendent, the board does not want to tell who your administrators are going to be. But we do want to be part of the process. We have some new board members. Now we have three new board members. Um, that should hear who our candidates are. We are one of the, we seem to be paying uh, almost close to 175,000 plus senators. The last couple of assistant principals we hired were in the range of 160 to 175 and plus cents. So we're talking about not chunk change. Um, I and I really I am strongly going on the record. I know you have to bet these candidates, but we I I am a strong believer that we should be interviewing two or three um, candidates, and I will go on record for that. Okay, thank you for your input. I know you had a conversation today. Um, if I remember correctly, since I've been on board, January 7th, there have been two candidates the board would interview. Okay. okay. Now, uh, gonna, uh, excuse point, me. I'm excuse me. Excuse me. Okay. And I will answer you. I, and I expect you to. And I will answer that. Um, there have been two candidates. This board has been uh, well aware of every step we have done, as I outlined to you with this principalship. But we had the um, dean of students. We had the director of agri-science, we were well aware of it. If the board wanted more than one candidate, all the board had to do was to tell its administration. This board did not do that. Neither did you, okay? okay. There is no reason why we couldn't have two or three candidates. If the board wanted two or three candidates, so be it. Okay. But you have to tell us before the final interviews are being done. I'm going to make a final okay. statement. Ralph, in the five and a half years I have been under Loretta, except for one, and I won't name him, except for one position, we have always interviewed at least two candidates. There was one time, and Cindy might come back me up, where we had one candidate and Jonathan was there, and we asked for them to go back and re review, and then he came back with, I can't remember, with two or three. So the board has always, in the five and a half years I was here, 
we have always been present, including the first month when we interviewed for the Madison position. So now three positions or two were already filled and I'm not objecting to it. The candidates were good, but we were not present. That's what I'm objecting to, okay? I'm assuming there were two or three. What I'm objecting to is we find out after the fact. Okay. Okay, wait a minute. Can I speak? Uh, right after I do, please. Because okay. I forget. I'm a lot older than you are. Uh, so let me get this. Um, if that is the case, and I believe you, there's no question about that. If you had felt that way, you're, you should tell your superintendent to, because in the weekend reports, I updated the board on this. And I said, we have one candidate or two, do you want to interview or not? And the board indicated it did not. Okay, Ralph, then I'm, I'm sadly mistaken. The conversations we have, then you did not hear me because I spoke over and over again when we knew about the Jane Ryan position. I said, we need to be present. So I guess we had a miscommunication. I'm going to end there. Okay, it could have been a miscommunication, but I will say this. It's my understanding that, I want to say this right, each board member can cast one vote. It was my understanding that four other or five other board members did not want to have the interview. And you mentioned the superintendent. And the reason why the board and the super, this superintendent was criticized is because of delays. Why were we delayed? We were delayed because of COVID. We couldn't get together. It wasn't because we wanted to do that. All right, we need to, we need to end this conversation right now. I'm yeah. going to end the conversation. I think the, um, what we're going to do is this, okay? This, with this coming up, what we will do is if uh, you go through your process, whatever your process is, if, um, we're, if the board is sitting here, we're all here. If you want to see more than two people, uh, let me know. But you got to let me know so I can tell him. Okay? If there has to be at least two, that's fine. And we can put that through. And I will also ask the board if they want to be in and come in and meet them or see them on Zoom. That's up to you, too. You can do that if you want. Just let me know, and I will make sure that I inform the superintendent. But uh, let, let's just say that was miscommunication and we'll leave it at that and we're going to move on. And I don't have a problem with that. The only thing is tell me now, do you want the one candidate vetted or do you want me to bring two candidates to the board? Because I will do what the board wants. Right, correct. So if uh, the way this is going, I would say you bring two and then you vet later. And I'll ask Jackie, I'll ask Scott, I'll ask Andy, you're in on this too now, and Mike and Marie, if you want, and Tim. I'd like to see two candidates at this time to do okay. information for Jackie. Scott? Uh, I'm, I'm actually okay. I'm okay with the one candidate based on what okay. I just heard. Okay, um, Andy? Uh, I would just want to follow whatever precedent has been set. So um, if Mrs. Petiti, I mean, if you guys that have been here longer than I, if that's been the precedent, I think we should follow it. Okay, you want to see two? Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Ward. I'm Chairman, I guess, as we all know, we are policy making people and any recommendations come from personnel, comes directly from the superintendent. But if the other board members want to talk, and meet with these people. I have no, no problem with that. Okay, so he's okay with that. And Mr. Gallo? I am also okay with, um, if, if there are board members who would like to see two candidates, then I am in agreement that that's certainly well within their right to do that. So I, I'm fine with that. Okay, and I'm fine with that too. So you can proceed. Okay. Yes, no problem. Okay, thank you. Are All we, right. Are we still on the reopening? Of yes. yes, we are reopening because I have a question. Mr. Morello is here. Okay, yeah. let me just finish up the. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, as the board and public are aware, at our last board meeting, the district announced that uh, we selected the hybrid learning model uh, and continue to develop that plan for implementation. Uh, all the districts in the state now are getting down to uh, the last few weeks and uh, are running into difficulties. Uh, several communities have jump from one plan to another plan for a variety of reasons. Uh, we also mentioned previously was the fact that many of our staff members were surveyed 
to determine their return status and uh, whether it's a medical child rearing or uh, a regular disability. As of today, our return numbers are okay. But in the law, you have to give them a staff two weeks, certified staff two weeks notice uh, to respond. Okay, we're still getting back um, replies and it's a serious concern is the number of staff forms who have not been processed yet. And we understand why, because they have that time um, um, flex. Um, there are approximately 20 to 25 staff members who at this time, potentially, we are going to have to find replacements for, okay? We are, we've been do, doing this during the summer, outreaching to sub lists, um, uh, other communities, uh, posting them on Connecticut Reef, um, and we're making progress. But it, it, I'm gonna be very candid. Our worst case scenario is that not enough teachers return and substitutes are unavailable. We may have to consider another learning model, okay? Um, because of that, um, we might have to have a special meeting of the board sometime next week, uh, have a better, uh, better numbers uh, outlook because uh, we're calling colleges tomorrow again to see if there's anybody out there. We can hire them as long-term replacements, um, which will bring them out of the subcategory and to put them in a higher bracket, okay, uh, probably step one of a teacher's salary. But if you can't get teachers, you can't run hybrid or in-school uh, university university learning, okay? Because with a hybrid plan, you have to have more, more teachers than you would do if you did nationally remote, you don't need more teachers, okay? So that's the update. It's uh, sort of like a good news, bad news report. Uh, we're monitoring it very closely as we have been for the last two months. Um, Kathleen and uh, Human Resources, uh, Mary and Joanne have really uh, gone above and beyond trying to call different teachers from like Southern, Central, the teaching institutions, UConn, uh, and we're still doing that and we'll continue to do that. But I'll update the board Friday in the weekend report and also let you know about the potential for um, Especially. Okay. Uh, Ralph, could I ask a couple of questions? Sure, Jackie. Sure. Uh, question, uh, if we were to change, do you think we should at least make parents, no one's here tonight, you know, no parents, no one listened in, no one asked a question. I think they think everything is set. They must be trying to get coverage for children on three days a week. Are we going to give them some forenotice that there is a possibility we would be going all virtual? Because, I mean, that could be really difficult for a family who has now worked to make hybrid work. Uh, your point is well taken, Jackie. In fact, Denise and I talked about that today. And uh, we will, what I said tonight publicly, we will send out uh, tomorrow to uh, make them uh, aware of the possibility. Yeah, I just think we owe that to them because babysitting will be a, re a reality. Uh, I know, yeah, I know you spoke about um, teachers, uh, and I, I know you answered some of my questions about paras that aren't returning. Uh, how are we on lunch monitors? You know, uh, we'll need more than the two or three that we had in the cafeteria. Uh, yes. Have um, we, are we seeking them? Or? Yes, we are. We're seeking them, we're putting ads in paper. Uh, we do need them. She was quarantined, as you know, but she worked from home trying to, you know, uh, obtain more. And we're still in that process. Okay. Particularly What's that number, number, Ralph? Do you, like, do you have a number of lunch aids that we need? Uh, John, there was about 20. We, uh, specifically our lunch aids have been- I can't hear you, John. Can't hear you, John. Can't hear you. Our lunch aids have just been in the K-5 schools and they've supervised students eating in the cafeteria. Now we're going to have two different types of lunch aids. Uh, some lunch aids, uh, elementary schools and middle schools will be delivering the food from the kitchen area to the classrooms and other lunch aids will be required to watch the children eat in their classrooms. As for the teachers, that is their duty-free lunch period, and uh, the current estimate is 40 needed uh, across the K-8 schools to fulfill that. So the advertisement is out. We encourage people to apply. It's two to three hours a day, and we would certainly work with people only available two days a week. We could make that work. 
Thank you. Great. Scott, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to, because I didn't quite hear the number. I just wanted to confirm, Ralph, when you were giving your report about the number of staff that you know aren't returning at this point. Did you did you say 20 to 25, or did I hear that right? Yes, that, that's correct. 20 to 25 that we feel will not be returning, that we have to replace them. But th and that number is evolving, could potentially be going up. Do you have a, you know, do you have a worst case scenario in your mind that it could go over 30, but I doubt it. Mary doubts it because um, she has already gotten, you know, several back already, but these are what we call in the pipeline, and those are the numbers that are still in the pipeline that she can tabulate. So she figures 25 is a solid number she told. Okay. And just one more follow-up, just a clarification. When you talked about the difference between long-term replacements and then long-term subs, is the distinction there that a, a long-term sub doesn't need a full certification, but a long-term replacement would? Well, long-term replacement, long replacement would be given a regular contract in, their, in the past, they've been duly certified by the state of Connecticut. Okay. The governor has given some flexibility with the colleges that school districts can hire people um, who are not uh, achieve all of the certification requirements. That's what we have to really, in essence, vet. And uh, one of the calls in uh, Mary put in today was to the uh, uh, teacher um, certification office. Uh, uh, I think it's Diane Perez up there uh, to uh, uh, quantify that. Okay, but I just. But the, the, to finish the, the answer to your question, sub replacements would get. $120. We went from 80 to 100 in the budget, but if they're a long term sub, they get 120 per day. But a long term replacement teacher gets more money, and they are usually on salary schedule. Okay. Yeah. So I had a few questions. Um, mine are a little bit more about the distance learning. So, Dr. Bud, you, you may be able to help out some of these answers. Um, and, and many of these questions came from a lot of the emails that have come in recently. So my first question is, what platform will we primarily be using for the synchronized learning? Um, are we looking at Zoom or are we looking at Google Meet? Where are we on that? The learning platform for grades three through 12 will be Google Classroom. For pre-K through grade two, there's a work group that's finalizing the choice tomorrow but I believe the outcome may be Seesaw, which is more developmentally appropriate for those younger students. And then the, uh, the application for actually the synchronous meetings will be Google Meets across the uh, great bands. So we will not be using Zoom? No, that's my understanding, we're not using Zoom. Okay, is there a reason for that? Uh, we have to talk to Christina Heffley and Jeff Hackett. Uh, they've made the decision on that. So I, I don't know that I can speak really specifically to it, other than it's supported by our Google Enterprise software. Okay, thank you. That, that was, yeah, that was it. Okay. Those were right. I, I, you know, there was just a lot of questions on that that parents had, and I just wanted to make sure um, that we covered it. And to just say a little bit more that I think is relevant, this team that's choosing the uh, pre-K through grade two uh, learning platform is also developing information and materials for parents on how to uh, help your children use the platform. And we also have materials uh, in development for Google Classroom for grades three through 12, although those students are a little bit more independent at this point. Okay. Jonathan, could I ask that you uh, share those with board members, you know, the parent piece that they create, because I'd Absolutely. like to see the yes. piece. Okay. I, my question, Madam Chair? Okay, go ahead, Mike. For a sign that because of the, it all comes into place, and we do start school, and we, last meeting I talked about, is it possible the elementary school can be put on a partial day or a half day, or is that pretty much, you know, you looked at it and say it's almost impossible to do, but. It's not you know, it almost about, it's very difficult to do. We talked about it. All right, why don't you talk about we it? We did talk about it. In fact, we talked about it after the last board meeting when you brought it up. We talked about it previous, but we wanted to give it another shot. And we figured, let's get into it. Um, 
And that was the final decision. That's right. I lost it a fair yeah. We did, you know. Oh, no, we did. We explored a lot of things. I you know, I, I, it's a good point because I want to emphasize this wasn't um, one person's uh, opinion or one person's decision. This came from a group of um, experts in their field. Okay. We had eight subgroups, whether it was health and wellness, facilities, John's here tonight. Uh, to answer any facility questions, I know there were. Um, um, instruction and learning, uh, it's, uh, technology, there were eight subgroups. And then we integrated them all together into one plan. And uh, it was, in essence, vetted. Um, principles. All right. Well, thank you very much. At least they looked at it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, I have some questions for Mr. Morello. He's here. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Here. Well, he's part of the school okay. uh, school reopening. Uh, right. For those who don't know in the audience, John is our uh, facility supervisor. Okay, just a couple of questions, Mr. Morello, just for my, my own sake. Um, I know Trumbull High School and Frenchtown are air conditioned, and you know in September it gets hot. And I, I know that we took a tour before this COVID thing and we were in Middlebrook and upstairs it was uh, blazing hot up there. And I know that they put an air conditioning unit in that room. My concern is uh, the middle school, Madison Middle, yeah. the upstairs gets very hot. I know it does. So when the kids are in there, even if it's 10 kids in a room, it's going to be very, very, very hot in there. So I don't know. Do we have, what's our ventilation issue or do we have air purifiers or is there something that we're gonna be doing to look at at these different schools that don't have these circulating air? The only the only things that- I can't hear you, John. You have to talk into this thing. The, the only thing that schools have that do not, the schools that do not have a central air system, the only thing they have are exhaust fans in the classrooms. And those are glorified bathroom exhaust fans. Of course, they're larger, but they function the same way. But there is no there there is no central air system, especially at as you mentioned, Middlebrook and Newport Mass. It's, it's oppressive. Uh, what about um, can we put some air purifiers in there just to clean the air at least? The problem with the air purifiers, Mr. Capelli, is that we don't know where they would be going in the schools, and the electrical system in these schools are so antiquated, we would be tripping breakers and we'd have electrical issues constantly. I did get a list from. Mary connect me today of, I believe, six classrooms based on teacher group uh, medical needs that we will have to provide. And I, I, we did buy five, and I will be checking those schools tomorrow to see the location. Those yeah, are you, five if you, Yeah, if, I, I would be happy if you could check into Madison and some of those schools that are really hot and have a second floor. That there, there's just problems in there because that will, that will cause an issue, I would think, for some students. Yes, I did look into buying them today, and the quickest the quickest place is Home Depot. They're $270 a piece. I checked all the surrounding Home Depots. Some had zero, some had one. The only Home Depot that had any was Trumbull. They had a pallet come in today, 23. 20 of them were designated for Sacred Heart. So I'm gonna have to go up there tomorrow to pick ours up, and I'm gonna talk to the girl that I usually talk to who runs the um, uh, contractor's division. She's going to see if she can get me more. Now, these won't help with the heat, though. Correct. These are correct. Now, what would be the they difference need, between they why could we have a portable, uh, the portable air conditioning units? Would they also purify the air? They do. They do. And the, cool. the portable air conditioners have a greater draw, uh, electrical draw. The, the portable air conditioners that you just stand in the room and you can bend out the window. Those require a 20 amp separate circuit from an electrical panel. Mm -hmm. The purifiers that I purchased today only require 1.5 amps. So that's a lot easier to you know, find a spot in a classroom or a hallway or a common space where I could put these as opposed to a, a portable air conditioner. But the oppressive heat problem is it's not going to be solved. And that's going to be very difficult for students who are wearing masks for all, all during that time Correct. as well. That's, that's a big concern across the state. One of the reasons why we started later is because uh, we're, we're so worried about schools that we can't, um, you know. Dave, could I interject? That was one of the reasons why, this is a follow-up to Mike too, we thought about just going remote learning. But there are pluses and minuses. I mean, remote's got the child rearing, this has the heat. 
you try to balance it in that's what you come down to. When John and I talk about it with David Irwin, it, you build the buildings are so antiquated that it can't have that handle the the electrical um, fire resistance. Right. And you, you to maximize their usage, you want to leave them on when the buildings are vacant. Mm -hmm. And we really can't leave those on if we've got even custodians on the building. Okay, does anyone else have a question for Mr. Morello? No? Can I just add one thing? Um, remember, I said that our plan evolves. Okay, one of the things that when we meet every day, um, for your information, I was going to come to the weekend report, but I'm not, you know, my public here too. Wednesday is the sanitation day, sanitizing. Okay, where uh, no one should be in the building, and we do that. We've also included now Saturdays, Correct. half days, Saturdays, half days, although we're paying time and a half. Um, we, we feel the need to really take care of Monday, Tuesday, they're in. Wednesday, we clean. Thursday, Friday, they're in. Saturday, half day, we clean so that they can come in Monday. Uh, and we're trying to limit, you know, um, all the uses at night. Uh, schools are going to be closed at six. Um, we have a request on our table right now. We're discussing where uh, one organization wants to use all the gyms every night of the week. Uh, we're leaning not to allow that. We, we know. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> we, we understand. But the only reason I'm saying that is because this, there's still a question um, in elementary school if the PE courses are going to be running in the gyms. They probably will not be. We talked to the principals. I know Jonathan talked to the principals Why today not? on that because of the uh, uh, sanitation, clean on the cleanliness. Okay. The but the gyms are open 612, aren't they? 612, they're going to be using the gym, aren't they? Right. The judgment there is that in the 612. Can't hear you, Jonathan. Sorry. They're telling me they can't hear you. The, six, the 612 buildings, there aren't feasible classroom spaces for all of the physical education classes to go into. Um, Trumbull High School, as an example, has many periods where there just isn't available classroom space. So there's a, there's a necessity for it at 612. The K-5, and we've talked about this again today with Dave and uh, John and Ralph to make a final decision, the amount of custodial support in the building would not support the CDC and the CST guideline is that we would have to sanitize the gym in between every class which at the elementary level is every 30 minutes, and the custodian would have to do it in five minutes to get the next class in, uh, that would divert their resources from things that are absolutely necessary like bathroom sanitation. So what we have for K-5 is the goals, uh, the gyms as a goal to work for in the opening weeks of school, but their first priority would be to uh, focus their sanitation efforts on the hallways, bathrooms, et cetera because those opening weeks of school physical education, uh, judged by the principals, K-5, will have many days it can happen outside, yeah. and then other activities can be accomplished in the classroom and still support the objectives. At the middle schools and the high schools, for a couple of reasons related to classroom space as well as security, um, those things are not that possible. So they can go outside for classes? Yes. Physical yes. Education yes. Classes, because absolutely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Defer to Mr. Ward and, and Mrs. Marcel in the elementary school because I do think that they need to have some kind of exercise. And if they can get outside, I think that's a great thing. I Listen, think that they've always movie. gone outside for gym during good weather. I mean, we most of the schools even have these ball pits that were built by the PTA outdoors. You know, it's a wonderful activity. Almost every school has basketball ho hoops. They have the playscapes. I don't know what will be with the playscapes and their use, you know, because of cleaning them. But there's everything they could do outside up until November. We kept our kids outside as much as we can. And in the winter, by policy, and the, there are many days you can go outside in the winter. You know, you have to look at the weather and the, if the wind chill and whatnot. So, and, and spring. So there is plenty to do outside. And within the classrooms, the younger grades use this program called Noodle, where they dance and do movement. Movement has become very important in the elementary school. I'm sure, Tim, even in fifth grade, you do some movement 
with kids and yeah, they, so, so, so I mean, they will use their bodies. There isn't an elementary school teacher besides the gym teacher who won't make sure that they move. I mean, if you want to have a good day, you make sure the elementary school children move. Um, Mike, also, I don't know. My understanding is the outside landscapes are not to be used for even us by the students. It's just get outside. Because of the same sanitation. Because of the sanitation. The would have to go out and but I thought reading the report that the reports report, they talked about I hate to say this Sunday, the night before school opens on Monday was the time to do some other thing. Now that that's gonna happen on Saturday, you get all cleaned up and they got a full day. Then all of a sudden Monday, I maybe I missed that report yeah. from the CDC. Did it say Sunday? Did I miss it? I'm a, I, I didn't see it, Mr. Ward, well, on Sunday. I didn't see that. Okay, okay. well I wore it on for Sundays. Well, we can you can find out after the close of a couple of weeks. Sure. sure. Yeah, okay. I'm going to do it. Because we're going to bring the whole the whole staff in day and night for four hours every Saturday. That's good. So we'll see how it goes the first weekend. If we have to adjust after that. Fine. But that would be double time on Sunday. Just we have the funds. Don't yeah. worry about the funds. Okay. We've got the money. Okay. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point, Mike, because that's where yeah. a lot of the $1.6 million that we just, in the relief funds, is going to be devoted to the facilities. Custodial, san sanitizing, air purifier. As John said, electrically, it can't handle it, oh. and it's counterproductive in certain places. We gotta look at that. I, I, I think. Well, I'm just gonna say something for myself. I know me, okay. and since I had bad allergies when I was a kid, and sitting in those rooms, I used to be sick all the time. So I don't. I'm not looking forward to seeing anybody getting sick just from the heat and alone. Right. You know. So if there's a way we can, if there's some other situation that you can find or some other, I don't know, there has to be a couple well, of these. Well, we can talk to George Estrada too, and he was here, okay? okay? okay. And he, uh, ideal way, you central air condition those buildings, yeah. but the cost is astronomical. I'm sure of it. I'm sure. So, Madam Chair, if, if I could just say, um, you know, we talk a lot about getting outside for gym, it, it, and we're also talking a lot about the school, uh, the classrooms that are, that are so oppressively hot. Um, could we possibly maybe move some of those classes outside? Yeah, as we, as we talk about outside learning, I mean, all across the nation, they're doing different things with tents outside and all, all types of things. So what other opportunities do we have to learn outside? We've had conversations involving Scott, Secu Scott, Scott Sikora, the security director, in relation to this, and he wants to continue the conversations after we're in school a couple of weeks and other things are buttoned up. We have in general some concerns at schools about many classes being outside due to security reasons and protocols that were implemented in the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of our schools have one security person. Um, and uh, in addition to all of the other things that they've been doing, they will have added responsibilities such as the daily lunch pickups in the front of the building and really, um, um, camping down on contractors or visitors. So Scott would like us to readdress that idea a couple weeks into the opening, but recognizing that beyond recess and beyond uh, time when students can be outside for physical education, we should see if there are other opportunities. I will say that in addition, this doesn't totally mitigate what you're talking about, but the principals of those buildings that are more oppressively hot have been really looking for where are the cooler places that classrooms could be relocated. For example, um, some of the learning commons, library, and media centers might be very good places for that. Because we won't be able to wait. I mean, for those, they're, they're not, after a few weeks, they're not going to be hot anymore. So, I mean, it's really, it's the critical time at, at the, these very first two weeks. So, they, you know, creativity is going to be very, very important in those rooms. I, I worry about those kids trying to wear those masks in, in, in that hot environment. I, I just don't think it's, it's going to work. So. Uh, Chair Brown, a quick point there. Uh, and are we pursuing to help any uh, personnel additional to the one school nurse or all those yes. students? Yes, we are working with the parent educator group because the health aid is a designation by stipend in their group to identify one paraprofessional in each building who will be assigned to that isolation room. And uh, then that paraprofessional's job responsibilities would be replaced by somebody else. Yeah, we've got a plan for school nurses that an emergency would occur at the school. Give a 
there are they have people available, personnel, certified nurses. I'm just wondering. Yeah. Um, per se, the Board of Education, but school nurses under the Maiden Nest Anger has done a really good job. Um, they have to have some sort of uh, uh, operational plan in case in the, of an yeah, emergency. Okay. Or the, the, the airplane. I would assume that, yes. Um, I, one more question. Um, what about fans in those rooms? Because it just came out, CDC just came out with something that said that the fans can be placed in front of in front of windows. Yes. Yes. You could put a fan in, in a window and have it blow out. Right. But the problem is the windows in the schools, the older schools, all the schools, they're not conventional windows like you have in your house that you slide up okay. or crank out or tilt. Mm -hmm. So you, there's no way to get the fan in the window. Well, what about the sit, sitting in front of the window? I mean, there's counters and things in the right. front of the floor, even if you have a little folding table or something. The, the window is only, to, but you can't, you you, if you're going to put it in the window, you want it to be fully discharging out the window. Sure. You don't want it to bounce off the glass and come back. Right. Could I ask John one question? Uh, John, have yeah. in the elementary schools, have all the class, classrooms, the student classrooms, had half of their furniture removed so that they are down to like 13 or 14 desks? They, we have a combination of desks and tables in the rooms. Ms. Norcell, uh, we took school, we have, every school has a storage container where we walk every school, Dave Irwin and myself, and we directed the principals that only the minimum amount of furniture could be in those rooms. To answer your question, I believe some of the teachers are keeping all the desks in the room. Ralph, I think you should look at that. The whole idea is to have the air flow in the rooms, and that's the whole reason to have just 13 or 14 students and just furniture for that many. It's also less to clean. There should be no reason to clean 26 or 27 desks on Wednesday, Saturday. The reason why they did that. Right. The, for instance, the, the kids that come to school on Monday and Tuesday, they're going to have a signed seat in the classroom. So, so they'll sit in the same row, the same seat on Monday and Tuesday. The kids that come Thursday and Friday will sit in the next row. So they'll always, the kids are always going to sit in the same seat. They'll, they'll never be cross contaminating the desks. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So, having said a math person, I understand where you're coming from, but I would think I would uh, be in agreement with Ms. Marcel that having less furniture in your would allow more space, granted, you have to clean it. But it would be hard to get small children to say, don't touch desk A, you're only supposed to be in desk B. If desk A is not there, the impression I got is that they're actually going to X off the desks. I don't know how that'll look. Move forward. There's, there's some signage for that. Don't you write a book about this? I don't know. I think I have to be honest. I'll tell you. It's tough to turn a public school. It's tough to turn a public school into a mini hospital, and that's worth attention to. That's all I have to say. Okay. No other questions from anyone. Mr. Gallo, nothing? No. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. I, I just want to add a follow up for um, Ralph on the, in, in his opening, he ta you talked about Ralph, the idea of, uh, you know, possibly needing to shift gears as a result of the staffing situation. Can, can you be a little more specific? Like, can we, is, is what you're suggesting that we might go to uh, opening remote for several weeks? The, you know, the Department of Education has given all districts up to four weeks, I think, without penalty. Is, is that what you have in mind, just so we have an idea? Well, that, that's the only other option available. If we cannot staff properly and ensure the safety of the students uh, and staff themselves, uh, we'd have to look at the other option. We can't go one-on-one um, -on -one live we'd have to go to remote. Right. Some districts are doing that. And I'm going to be and very candid with you, Scott. It could be the benefit if it gives us home. time. In the first two months, there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Something happens, whether it's a vaccine, whether it's 
unfortunate, God forbid, an increase in um, COVID cases where everybody's going to have to go remote. It's the unknown. Remember my analogy with the jigsaw puzzle. You had it all done, it looks great, but you're missing 10 pieces, and they're the key pieces to finish the puzzle. But it would have to be remote. If we ever had a change from hybrid, it would have to be remote. Making that As decision. Jackie said, I will point that out, Jackie, when we send out uh, an e blast to parents um, mirroring what I said tonight. Thank you. I think that's very good, and that will make the community feel like they're part of it. Yeah, because we certainly need to acknowledge the challenges that presents for, for families. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to name that for our staff and preparation, giving us more time to, to recruit the, the uh, long-term uh, replacements that we need. Um, it, you know, it, it could be the, the right decision. So I just want okay, to say it out loud. I think it's 10 o'clock. I will be up at the uh, Trumbo High School a TV studio uh, having um, taping what we call a mini convocation. I thought it was important for us in the spirit of communication with everybody to welcome the staff back. So I'll have a four or five minute welcome back to them and pointing out some of these things. And also Marty will have a couple minutes and we have our paraeducators I mentioned in our teacher of the year be announced because I thought you just can't have people commit. You, you got to embrace them. We're glad to see you. We're working together. This is a difficult situation. It's, it's something that's thrust upon us. We, and I want to go through the litany of things we've overcome. People don't realize what this school district has overcome, whether it's the $1.2 million deficit, the budget reduction of $2.2 million, graduation issues, um, the, um, the COVID-19 that of course, the racial, uh, the uh, inharmonious racial strife that we're facing, the looting, all these things, they impact and they all have their ripple effect. And but we've gotten through it. The staff have done a great job. And when I say staff, I don't mean just teachers. I'm talking custodians, our everybody. It's partnership together to make it better. And uh, we've been through one tough time as other communities have too. But we've been fortunate here in Trump. There were more issues than other communities had. Okay, think about it. We had a change in the superintendency half the year. We had a board member resign publicly at a board meeting. These things take its toll and people have to realize that. They just don't occur in a vacuum. Okay. I, and I'm going to put a thought in your mind, okay, for Mr. Isaac, Mr. Dr. Bud, and Mr. Morello. I know that you all meet mostly every day on certain issues. And as you meet every day on these issues and you hear what we brought up tonight and what we said and what we think about different things, um, are you going to meet with this reopening committee again or the chairs from the reopening committee? I mean, do you meet with them? Do you see them? It, it wasn't our plan to do so because the time and also they have completed their charge. They came up with the specificity of each division. Okay. But, but if necessary, we could. Well, you, but now that you've seen it, now that you remember, with the we had two instructional forms, too. Right. Okay. But now that you've seen the plan and you hear all these different issues that come up, I just like to know where they're discussed. These different issues that we brought up tonight. Where are they discussed when they leave? Well, they were discussed originally at the subcommittee level. Okay, they were also discussed during the instructional forums. Okay. okay. Well, I just want to make sure that we're on top of this and that. We're trying our best. Do, yeah. And if necessary, we will meet with them again, just the chairs. Yeah, just to see if, if after hearing all this information, and you know, a lot of times the, the Board of Ed gets emails and it's <laughs> not to you or to the superintendent or the assistant superintendent, it's just to us. And it really should be directed to you so you can respond because the opening committee did have input into this. So, you know, when they ask us questions, why? 
you know, we need to ask you those questions. Yeah, and, and we, so we I want you to. And mean, that's why we can be sure here. If, you know, one thing we're sure is that tomorrow things will change. So this is on a daily basis, and we have to have a vehicle. Yeah. We have to have a vehicle to be able to solve the problems of of, of the change that, that we are going to be getting. So I think to clarify a little bit, Mrs. Timpanelli, I think that what you're trying to say is, you know, we brought up a lot of new things tonight. We talked about the aggressive classrooms, and you know, we learned about the windows and, and the style of windows that we have that will now not allow for fans really to help us. So these are new things that were just brought up tonight. So we need a vehicle, and I think this is what Mrs. Tipinelli was trying to say. Going forward, how will these things be handled if they're not going to go back to committee? Is, is it just going to be? No, not just central office. The building principles are very solid. They are a great sounding board. And Jonathan meets with them continuously and gets input. And we get a lot of input from our K-12 principals. And they, and they, and they speak to their people. Yes. Yes. They communicate. They've been having Google Meet. Uh, they've done both Google Meets with PTAs and also Google Meet. It's not an avoidant. Department chairs. I would say at the point we're at, barring some enormous change, we are really in now the implementation phase. And um, I've been meeting with the principals a couple hours every day, both elementary and secondary. But they are on with each other four or five hours per day, really ironing out these nuts and bolts. The furniture question and the pros and cons. How long will it take to move the furniture out? Where will it go? And who's going to do those kinds of things? So, say at the six elementary schools, that they're really on the same page where it matters. And then if they're making a difference, um, that it's defensible. Uh, Frenchtown because of this versus Blue Hill because of that. Uh, and sometimes uh, all that implementation takes a long time because you are changing every part of the system. And, and this plan evolves. I'll give you a perfect example of what Jonathan's talking about. We had strictly alphabetical, number A to M, I think it was, N to Z, pre-K-12. Based on input from the elementary principals, Gary Kunchak, got them together. We're not doing that at the elementary level, okay? We're doing it by the enrollment, and Jonathan's going to get into that a little bit. But that's how you tweak your plan. You tweak your plan that way. I just want to make sure that everybody feels that they're ready to roll with this and that you're comfortable with it, and they're comfortable with it. That, that's what I think all of us want to know. That's my only question that I will have for the K 12 principals. And I've said this to John and to Jeff Hackett. You can attest to this. Are we ready? Is your school or division ready to open? And when I went to human resources, they said, yes. However, this is one area we got to really monitor. Okay. All right. Is anybody else with a question? Just a lot of no. no problems. Uh, are we on top of the transportation? Not besides buses, but the amount of cars that are becoming into each of these schools every exactly. morning, dropping kids off. Yeah. I hope things have been set up in a safety manner. Are we having police at each of the schools with assisting the? Yeah, you have a team at each school working on that. Yeah. John Perkins, Scott Sakura, the security director, yeah. Captain yeah. Golding of the police department, working with the building principal and really determining the best locations for all of that. And adding to that mix, uh, Mike, that um, kids have to be available to pick up breakfast on the way in, in that same location. So they are communicating that on a building-based uh, e-blast system to parents at that building. Yeah, you know, it would have been easier to pick up at the end of the school day is gonna be horrendous. I'm so we're on top of it there. Enough personnel to assist. And the drop off and the pickup of two. One of the things they'll check out, Mike, in the math stagger. In other words, if you're picking up your child from school, uh, in school, let's say a long time, gets out at three o'clock, early dismissal for those students with the parent notes could be 2 30, okay? And then the buses arrive quarter to three, three o'clock, so staggered. And again, it's just going to be. That's a building principal decision. Right. It's just, you know, the facility. The roadways, etc. Mr. Gallo said that key point about change, and there are parts of this that are actually impossible to predict until it happens. And that doesn't mean we're going to sacrifice health and safety or not try to pre plan.
but there are certain things we can't know until we actually have 50% of the building doing certain things. Uh, but they're working around the clock the principles uh, on this with us. Jonathan, I, I understand that, but I think if I'm a parent, I have to know about the principals have to notify parents about those staggered hours, just as I asked Ralph to let them know that we might have, because they can't change overnight. You know, where to drop them off, what's the difference? Parents need just as a lot of training, just as uh, everyone. So we have, can't get that out last minute. We can always change and say we need a change, but they're gonna need a diagram of the school showing them where the new spots are. And, you know, we're gonna have to see a little bit of that because if somebody was to say to me, oh, is this true? I have to drop my kid off around the corner. You know, we don't know. So you'll have to share with us, Ralph. Well, but they should go to the building principal too, Jackie. And you know, communication is important. Communication on central office part, building principal's part, teacher's part. That's why I was a little surprised with uh, Nick, who I highly respect, Banks, when he was talking. We have T TEA people on all these committees. Their role is not only to contribute to the outcome of the committee, but to share it with their teachers at their schools. That line of communication must be kept open. And Tim hit the nail on the head because it changes so quickly. Well, maybe that's something, Ralph, you could tell the principals that you know, they should feel free to send board members anything they have that they think would be important. And, you know, when I was a principal, I wouldn't send something to a board member unless the superintendent said it was okay to send them. So, you know, that's something for you to decide or to handle. And I wouldn't send an email to a principal. I agree, Jackie. I agree no. 100%. And, you know, this is a time where we need to work together. So, you know, please let the principal know that. I mean, if we have an idea, again, uh, we're all educators here. I'm currently an educator and I'm a little bit ahead in the process. Well, the schools are, are starting on, uh, on Monday, um, but at the, at the last minute, we are going to be hybrid. I, I'm sorry, we are going to be remote learning um, for our first week of school. We, we couldn't make it by the 31st. So we are a little bit ahead in this process. Um, we're all educators here. So please, if, if the principals do, have some ideas, please, you know, share them with us. Um, we we, we want to help. That's a good point. In fact, this uh, follow up to what Scott said. You said, what are the options where we, we have to go remote? Long term, we have to go remote if we can't get teachers. But we may say remote for the first month and then still try to get teachers to go hybrid. So there are options out there, but we have to really drill down to them with our principals and maybe the subcommittee heads. Pull them together. Well, the, the one thing that's important here is that it really changes the professional development. Of, so, you know, depending on, on what the decision is, I, and again, it's, we, we've done so much this week in my district, and now that we are going to be remote, it, it's going to be a drastic shift tomorrow in, in, our, in our professional development. So that's one thing that you have to try and stay at least a day ahead of, because, um, you know, if you have a whole day of professional development plans for the next day, all of a sudden, okay, no, we're remote now. That changes the, the the whole professional development drastically. It's a whole new new thing. So, um, Mrs. Timpanelli. Else? Uh, yeah, Mrs. Timpanelli, this is Andy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, just a question, and I, I apologize if everyone knows the answer to this question. But if we do have to go 100% remote, do we know? Is it set in stone as to how the kids are going to be taught? Or is that still a work in progress? Do we know, are we going to go back to the way my two kids just what, what they just went through remote? Or is it going to be different? I mean, is it already, is that policy well, set in stone? Great question. Let me touch upon it briefly and then Jonathan be more specific. Uh, we have stressed to our building principals and our staff and the TEA that if we do go remote, if uh, it has to be more rigorous, more challenging, okay? Um, remember, last time it was thrust upon us in an emergency situation. We're not in an emergency situation. We had have time to plan. So we really want to firm up and tighten up and make sure it's 
very in tune to the curriculum and we deliver it and it's difficult not not overbearing but not fluffy and that was a phrase that i think one of the um speakers used uh, a couple of weeks ago it's got to be more robust well uh, vigorous and robust okay sure so it's important to know that the curriculum of the courses and the grades a child is in um, is driving the instruction this year so a child who's in fourth grade is experiencing grade four literacy mathematics science etc because at the end of whenever this ends whether it's the middle of the year or the end of the year, that child needs to be in the same place to move on in the curriculum, perhaps to fifth grade if it's the end of the year. So at the hybrid phase, as we're currently moving toward, you have the two days where students will be in school. And, and those will be somewhat different for the reasons we've talked about, fewer kids, the mass breaks, et cetera. But they're the most typical of what's been happening all along. On the other three days, students will be participating in distance learning. And throughout all the regular hours of the typical school day, so again, to stay in elementary school, roughly 8.30 to 3 o'clock, a student will be expected to attend and to participate in a mix of synchronous activities, meaning that they, from home, are live streaming into their classes at school, their classroom at school, and interacting with what's happening there and the other peers in the classroom those days and also independent work. And to just give you a couple of brief examples, again, from the elementary perspective, our teachers will be working on, at grade levels, exactly what this will look like based on the curriculum. Uh, elementary school classrooms begin with morning meeting. So a natural time to keep building the community all these days is to have the students at home join in live streaming for the morning meeting. And so they're all able to interact at that point but our teachers will develop protocols for how the students who are online come online, how they're able to ask questions, how they interact with the students in the room. Move forward a couple hours and maybe we get to mathematics time. Well, it's a new lesson in mathematics on Thursday and you're going to want those students at home to watch the teacher give the lesson in mathematics and the teacher will control the camera, will control what is seen, but presumably students mostly need to see in that case the uh, teacher and maybe uh, the whiteboard that the teacher is using. And uh, then there'll be some point in the mathematics lesson where there's independent practice. And at that point, the students at home might be told, all right, this is the work for independent practice. You have uh, 30 minutes that we're allocating for this. And then there's gonna be a 15 minute break time. So if it's 10, 15 now, we'll wanna see everybody back at 11 o'clock and that's when we'll move to our special. That's when we'll move to science. So the camera in that official sense goes off at that time. Get to the very end of the day, I'm sure there'll be some closure for all the students to be in the same situation of what have we accomplished today and where are we moving forward to next day. So that's very different from what we saw in the spring, both in the mix of uh, synchronous live streaming with independent work and also that you're doing it within the hours of the class. And very briefly, the principle at the middle and high school is if it's 10:15 and it's period four and I'm an Italian class, then I'm expected as a student, if I'm home, to be ready to engage in Italian class. Regular schedule. Regular schedule. So would you, could you put a percentage on that? Like if you had to just give me a quick percentage of how much in, of the increase of the synchronized learning would be compared to where it was when we were on our emergency 13 weeks. In the spring, because it was dependent on teacher, um, you will see that some parents will report it was very infrequent in the spring, and they're going to see a dramatic increase now. For other, uh, other parents, saw it more regularly in the spring, but what they will see now is it's a regular part of instruction. In other words, uh, any reasonable elementary school teacher will say, well, for students to really understand a math lesson, they need to see me present it, not just read it on a computer. So it's going to be a regular part of the curriculum. And then when those students who are home on Monday, Tuesday, and have done some distance learning Wednesday, show up Thursday, Friday, the teacher is operating on the assumption they've done the work of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and we're moving on. Uh, assessment, grading, although it would be logically modified based on some of the situation we're in, is back to the standards-based grading in K-5 and letter grades 612 
because these students will benefit from having their social and emotional needs attended to, but also be back in the routine of school. And we know that a lot of kids are, are thirsty for that right now, too. Okay, I think thank you. I think we've done now. Okay, let us go on to uh, the student enrollment, Dr. Bud. Well, if it weren't for these rising numbers, what would we have to talk about? So this is the this is the key update because it's the last update you have before the September 8th start of school. So I've added a few things tonight based on your presentation, uh, based on your comments last time, and Michelle just needs a minute or two to get this up. But I want to just say that your policy on class size for K-5 makes a distinction between whether classes grow before the school year starts or after the school year starts. So you've made very good, we've, you've supported our recommendations the past few weeks, and we appreciate that. And we're gonna have some more recommendations tonight so that every elementary school and every grade at every elementary school is in a fair position going forward. So we'll just wait till it gets up so the public can see it as well. All right, we see it. Okay, thank you. So I wanted to give you some updates here on our alternate enrollment statuses. We don't normally provide this, but this year is different. Everything about enrollment is challenged this year. Normally, our amount of students who move to homeschooling is very negligible. Um, some parents do it year to year, but I have shown you on page two that we are in the 20s, the mid 20s at this point, in parents who have disenrolled their children uh, from Trumbull Public Schools in favor of homeschooling. And that, remember, homeschooling is an option where the parent totally disenrolls, does education at home, and we welcome this child back whenever. Uh, you will see there is a slightly more disproportionate amount of that at the elementary school level, and we continue to monitor that. Monitor that. Those students who have homeschooled have been removed from the numbers at the elementary schools on the next pages, because if they've made that decision, they're not coming back. So even as our enrollment registrations keep moving upward, we have some subtractions every day with the homeschool. I have the slide here on the basic principles. It's the same as two weeks ago, which is 20 students per section for kindergarten, 22 students per section grades one and two, and 25 students a section in grades three and five. They're your tripping points by policy where you say, listen, if we're above that before the year starts, we should add a section. So the changes that are significant are in red. So in Booth Hill, we have surpassed in grade one the amount of students and moved over into where we need to add a fifth section. And we talked to Mr. Pierce this morning about it. The breaking point is really when you exceed 88 students. We are on a solid 90 students in grade one at Booth Hill. Uh, kindergarten continues to be right at the point. And I'll come back to that at the end. Mr. Ayasag and I have a recommendation about that. But this will move uh, Booth Hill to 25 sections. Um, this may be asked later, so I'll say it now. Like last year, that means that a section will be taught in the typical art room. However, art is being taught in all classrooms this year at any rate, so it's less impactful than in the past. What's the number for kindergarten there? 80, what would be the cap number that would be? If you went to 81, that would 81. be number, but it has very, stayed very there a long, long time, yeah. Um, Daniel's Farm has tripped over as well since our meeting two weeks ago. Daniel's Farm has gone quickly from 88 to 92 at grade two, requiring a fifth section there. So Daniel's Farm, which is now at 509 students, requires 26 sections by your board policy. Frenchtown, which had been stable, is still stable, but I need to let you know you're on the precipice at grade four 
for another section there. And we tend to see stock for Frenchtown and Middlebrook come in slightly later because of higher proportions of rental units in those parts of town. So it would not surprise me if that 75 moves over uh, before the start of school. But that has not been that high at previous meetings. Jane Ryan benefits from the decisions you supported two weeks ago. Uh, you supported a fourth section of kindergarten. That has panned out. That's well into the mid-60s. And you've supported a third section of grade three, which was wise. And then Middlebrook is represented here. It's no major changes, uh, a couple here and a couple there, but nothing that makes it, we like to say, near the cusp. And Tashua has been just the stalwart this season. It is, uh, it is class sizes that are not near the cusp at any grade. So if you go to the summary page, you'll see that we've reduced this, but it's not necessarily an easy reduction. Here's the thing. Uh, kindergarten is currently with 24 sections and Booth Hill may take it to 25. Grade four is currently at 23 sections. Frenchtown may take it to 24. You are currently scheduled, students in current students are currently scheduled into 144 elementary sections. Last year, we were at 142. And so this is two sections higher than last year. We did put some money in reserve for negotiations in case this happened, but it could go to 146, which was not predictable. Now, the interesting thing is uh, the, the formal chart uh, that Mrs. Butler does is on the next page that shows how this all divides into sections. And you will see the summary year to year. Now, the thing to keep in mind is this is the last day school was in session in June compared to, it's actually not 8-11, it's actually today. The heading on that column is incorrect. We are short by 59 students. There's no doubt in my mind we'll exceed that because we currently have 75 K-5 students who have started the process and it takes us a few days. We try to get this within 48 hours, the closer they get to the start of school. Some of those 75 will not be able to prove residency, which we are rigorous on for obvious reasons, but some of them will be able to prove they just haven't done it yet. So without a doubt, in my mind, we will exceed the 2879 when we actually open the doors this year. The next page shows you the 612 enrollment. And uh, we are down there currently from where we left off last year, 86 students. We have 50 of them right now in the enrollment process. Uh, I would anticipate that this will break even as the year starts. And uh, we'll see, we'll have another report for you obviously, but. Uh, K-5 is surely going to trip over last year. 6-12 is probably going to get close to it. And no. so then if you look at the next slide, the total grades K-12 to summary year to year is represented by uh, currently 145 below, but we have nearly 130 students that we work on in my office for the registration and process uh, a couple dozen every day on that. So I can answer questions about K-5, but perhaps let me just do the other couple elements of this presentation first. A board member asked two weeks ago about Trumbull High School class sizes. We offer over 250 courses at Trumbull High School, and I decided that tonight it would be overwhelming in this presentation to try to give every department. So I picked four classes that every, nearly every student takes. And I looked at the class size average and the range at the ACP level, which is where we have the most uh, amount of sections. And so the uh, ACP English 10, uh, ACP Algebra 2, and ACP Biology typically taken by 10th graders. The state of Connecticut uses the English and the biology to track class sizes across districts. ACP Global Civ is a social studies course in ninth grade. So the averages there are very satisfactory, and you see the ranges. I would say not to be concerned about the ranges that are slightly on the lower side. Uh, those 13s in Algebra 2 and Global Civilization can occur because in a complicated schedule, you have some sections that have to run against other types of courses at a high school. 
also it can be that certain students, for example, ELL students in math are clustered into those certain sections. So I felt it was important to show you the average as well as the range. But we don't add sections at the high school like we do K-5 to every two weeks in the summer. So it's important to know if we have a class size average now of 22, more students coming into 10th grade creep that up to 24, 25 as the year begins and throughout the year. Finally, I wanted to show you where we are with temporary remote learning. Now, temporary remote learning is the concept that the state has asked districts to adopt where parents and families who are uncomfortable about sending their students in two days a week can decide to keep them at home five days for distance learning. And currently we have slightly over 500 students who have opted for this for September 8th. That's a seven and a half percent. And you will see it is heaviest at the elementary school level. Uh, kind of predictably, it tails off at the high school level to slightly above five. I would predict that this will get in the upcoming days uh, up to and over 10%. And uh, we are implementing instructional programming for these students that will focus on the core curriculum as well as on important electives in which they're enrolled. Ralph mentioned earlier teachers who are approved to work from home because um, under FMLA or FFCRA, they are given uh, other work assignments. Those teachers will be assigned in many cases to work with temporary remote learning students because they're very experienced teachers. That's work they can do from their home. They can't supervise kids in school from their homes, but they can do distance learning with this group of students from home. So every day what we're doing with Mary Connect Me at HR is working on the matrix of the teachers and the matrix of the students to marry them the best possible way. So finally, we get to the summary page. So what we would ask is for you to endorse based on your policy, adding a fifth section to Boot Hill grade one, a fifth section to Boot Hill, excuse me, a fifth section to Daniels Farm grade two, and to allow us to monitor Boot Hill Kindergarten and Frenchtown grade four to add sections before the start of the student year if necessary. Those are the only two right now truly on the cusp. And then I've clarified here the needs for additional long-term substitutes for people working from home. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bud. That was, that was very detailed. So what you're looking for, Yeah, what you're looking for now is to, you want us to agree that there needs to be a section at Blue Hill grade one and a section at Daniel's Farm School grade two, is that correct? Yes, I would and to, to encourage the administration to add prior to your next meeting that Blue Hill Kindergarten and Frenchtown grade four go over. Was there another school on the cusp at Daniel's Farm? Yes, and it went off another the class. And yes, and it grade. went off the cusp since the last week. And I don't what know. Grade level, was that four? four? It may have been four. Yeah. But but four is clearly at five sections at 104. Okay. And all Do you of know the, what that cap number would normally be? Well, they're at 104 now. Yeah, four sections got them to 100. So when they got past that, we had already added. Okay. And so they have to get to 125 to be able to. Yeah, to get to a sixth, and that would really be. Oh, I'll yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, do you want us to make a motion to? Uh, I would be comfortable you know, with that. Yeah. Then with this, but you're abiding by your policy. I'm, as long as we're abiding by the policy, I see no reason that anyone has any comment. I think it's okay to say yes. Yes, just to yes. Just give administration approval to do it. That's all, do it. Yeah, so we can, if we don't feel the same way, I give um, Mr. Isaac and Mr. Uh, Dr. Bud. You have permission to proceed with that, with those two requests? Thank you, and we have, we have uh, teachers in the pipeline. Based okay. on uh, one, uh, Madam Chair, may I ask one question about that? Sure. Just because um, I think you mentioned, or somebody mentioned at one point, and in a prior meeting, I know it was raised about that the, you know, that we did have uh, funds in the reserve for negotiation um, to cover some of the additions that we've made. 
can can you just clarify like have all of the other the other items that we were reserving that money for have they it's this at this point been settled so that we actually do have those funds we do have some funds available in that account uh, for your information al cameron has returned from um, tennessee and he is now on call he's got a 14-day quarantine Peg is talking to him daily, and uh, it's my understanding one of the conversations indicated that we do have what monies available in that account. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. One, okay. One question I'm sure I, I noticed Bill Chris and Madison alone is very informal. It's always been the opposite. Madison Madison oh. had a large eighth grade department. Oh. We go to ninth. Obviously, we go to ninth grade. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to Mr. Kerr for the facilities update. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. This is um, my first report out from the facilities committee, although we've met um, several times uh, since I came on board as the chair. But we did meet last Thursday on the 20th. Um, we didn't have a quorum because unfortunately Mr. Ward was not able to join us, but uh, Ms. Tipinelli did join us and we were able to hear reports from uh, Dave Irwin and, and John Morello. Uh, there are just a few highlights that I wanted to um, make people aware of. As we went over the, the planned projects list, there were um, a few that we you know, said that we had to put on hold either due to um, a lack of funding at this time or um, just the, the manpower and, and, effort and um, availability of resources to, uh, to work on them when we're in the middle of all the other work we're doing for school readiness. And I just wanted to say those, were, those projects were um, the upgrade and replacement of, of locks in some of the buildings. It's a long-term project to just upgrade some of the, the door handles and locks. Um, the construction of a two-stage vestibule, vestibule entryway at Madison Middle School, um, which I think is, is something that we would all deem important uh, to get done as soon as possible, but it's on hold at this point. Um, and repairing of an air handler at Trumbull High School that services the um, auditorium is, uh, is an item that's been put on hold. It's running at a reduced capacity and working okay. Uh, but long term, it's going to need to be dealt with. Um, I hope I think John is still there, so he'll be able to answer any specific questions that people might have about anything that I say. But um, uh, there was one other project that John mentioned, and we added to our list to be um, tracking, and that is that um, during readiness work, we uncovered um, a few small areas in some of the buildings that had mold that needed to be remediated, and so that's being worked on. And as we discussed that, we, we talked about the idea that at some point, and again, once we get past opening and we know that everything is running smoothly and everyone's safe, um, but that as a facilities organization, we might um, consider uh, finding a consultant to, to look at coming through our buildings and doing a sweep and looking for any risk areas uh, that we should maybe jump on, right? Because they're as we all know, they're old buildings um, and, and things can crop up. So that's something that um, John and Dave Irwin are going to be uh, thinking about. Um, an important update, and I think John already has touched on some of this in terms of it earlier in the meeting, but the, the buildings are, are four facilities that have central air systems. Uh, John has been working very diligently to ensure that we're we're doing the maintenance and replacement of filters in those systems um, to comply with all of the guidance that we've received. I know we received some letters from um, community members encouraging us to change the filters more frequently. Um, but I think, um, you know, John's advice based on, um, on his experience as well as the guidance that we received is that you want to do those things in accordance with the the manufacturer specifications and the CDC recommendations. So we're we're doing that, and again, John can speak to that specifically after my um, my update. The last um, thing that I think is important to to mention to the board 
was that um, Mr. Irwin expressed um, some concern about um, our ability and specifically um, John's ability because he's overseeing currently both um, the uh, maintenance crew as well as all of the custodial operations. Um, that the idea of having one person to uh, oversee all of that staff, which you know could be 55 to 60 people, um, is is really not not practical. Um, and Ms. Timpanelli you know, appropriately reminded us that uh, facilities is one of the areas that we have talked about um, talking to the town about a shared services um, operation. And so we uh, we absolutely are going to be reaching out for a meeting with Mr. Estrada and to get those dialogues really happening. But I did want to name, I think it's important that the board know that um, our, our custodial teams are really on the front lines today and we need to be prepared to support them with the appropriate um, uh, supervision and, and support. Um, so with that, John, if you don't mind uh, coming, you know, coming to the podium uh, to answer any questions that board members might have. And I, I also, I wanna, um, you know, offer my deepest gratitude to John uh, for the numerous balls that he's been keeping in the air, um, air, no pun intended, um, to safely um, open our schools in the next couple of weeks. So thank you, John. Thank you, John. John had to leave. He went to Trumbull High School to check on a custodial issue. You also mentioned one of the schools with more that happened to be announced. That was Middlebrook, and they're remediating that. Um, it was interesting that David mentioned to Scott and to John about giving some additional help. I had a conversation during my transition with Marty, and he asked me point blank, if you had extra money, where would you recommend to the board? And mine was to give John assistance below him, lower salary, he would supervise, but remember, and Marty and I were together on this, the business administrator, Paul, would oversee the plant. Okay, Marty feels very comfortable overseeing personnel. So you're saving money here. The only other place I told him you might want to look for some part-time help is in the curriculum area. We talked to Jonathan about that. But it was ironic that both of us said, give John a little help because he runs 24-7. And he just doesn't address a problem. He drills down, he takes care of it, he makes sure it's implemented, and he goes, goes back, like he just did. Now he's going back at nine o'clock at night to Trouble High School. What more, he is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Could I ask a question? Ralph and uh, during the budget, Lucinda, I believe we reduced our share of that office because Vicky was going to cover the other half. I mean, I remember when we built a budget. So I understood that the town was going to take over some of those responsibilities, not well, of the custodian, but of the- Let me answer that for you. Um, when, we, when Vicky did ask about that, she asked for a shared service and we said facilities. Right. That's why right now she has to, she asked us for a meeting. She wants to meet once school has started. She's going to meet with John Morello. She's going to meet with Dave Irwin. She's going to meet with, um, I don't know, maybe Marty will be here by then, just to talk about what kind of services they can do for us and they can take over. Because in, in my early years, we used to share services with the town. They used mm -hmm. to do some, yeah, they used to do, the town used to do some services for Trumbull Public, and then we had our own custodial staff. So we're going to look at that before we make any changes or any decisions on adding any kind of personnel. We want to see what she's going to give us first. And Lucinda, that can be, easily happen. Because when I was superintendent in about my 10th year, there was a recommendation. Um, we would take over the town's um, custodial group. And they would take over our outside maintenance. That's correct. Because they have the big machinery for cutting of grass, bushes, etc. And we have a custodial you know, the expert that can handle the seven buildings of theirs. And that would work out very well monetarily and also in efficiency. 
Right. And that's something I would recommend. Yeah, and that's what we're going to look for. So we're going to wait for that meeting to see what she says and what she recommends to us and how we can Good. do the service. Okay. Well, right. uh, Scott, thank you very much for your report. That was very detailed. Yes. I'm glad that everybody heard everything and that's exactly what's been going on. So, uh, thank you. no other questions here. On nice job, Scott. Report. Chairman, I'll make the motion to adjourn this. Okay, can I have a second? Second. Second. Okay, adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone. Good night.